the role of prime minister is it is it one that you you enjoy is it one you want to do or is it one that you feel you do out of duty i love my job <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do this unless you had a passion for it the hours are long and while most days are great not every day is great so there's got to be something in it that you find absolutely compelling and what I love is the opportunity to be able to make a difference for my country and for our communities and the community I represent. So that's what I'm in it for, a passion. There must be days though when, when because people are unkind. I mean, there, there was the famous incident with the, um, I think it was the Australian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who claimed you were a left-wing control freak. <laughs> I mean, there must be days when you think, oh, why am I doing this? I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was written for a previous Australian Prime Minister and somehow ended up on the file for Kevin Rudd, who was mortified. <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, if you're running the country, you have to be a control freak to an extent, don't you? Well, you've got to show strong leadership for sure. You don't want people running all over the deck when they should be sailing the ship, you know, getting the sails up, taking them down and so on. Because that's one of the, the, the things that I think has marked your, your premiership is that you, you know what's going on. You, you know what your team are doing. You know what the country's doing. Is, is it hard? Do you, do you find yourself awake every hour to keep on top of all that? I like people to tell me what's going on. I like to have a heads up you know, if something's happening that my colleagues think I should know about, they need to text me, they need to phone me, they need to phone my chief of staff, my press secretary, somebody, just so I'm not surprised, particularly at a time of year like this when, when I go out uh, on public engagements, I've got a lot of media. For example, I go to my local school today to do something with one of the breakfast uh, radio shows and the school knew the breakfast radio show was coming, but all of a sudden about 25 adults are in the room, there's TV cameras whirring and photos going. So I need to know if anything out of left field is going to pop out and, and uh, be asked to me. One of the key criticisms that I think that, that sometimes is, is levelled at, at, at the Labour government over the last few years has been one of interference in people's ordinary lives. I mean, light bulbs, snacking, um, showers, electricity heaters. Is that a criticism that, that you can see where people are coming from, that one of micromanagement of what people are doing? Well, a lot of it's simply made up. The shower story didn't have a shred of truth <laughs> to it. <laughs> so you know, the, the sooner we, we were able to pour cold water on <laughs> that one, the better. But personally, I'm someone who doesn't like being told what to do. I like the maximum freedom to live my life. I think we all do. Uh, there's, there's some things like the light bulbs where around the Western world countries are phasing out those old light bulbs. The Australians announced a phase out timetable probably a year or two before we did. So these things happen because countries say it's in the interests of being cleaner and greener basically and that's something we in New Zealand pride ourselves on. Do you think the fact that we're such a small country though means that, that people, people view you much more closely than perhaps in a, in a bigger country because you know, we all know where you live. That sounds a bit threatening, doesn't it? <laughs> we all know where you live. We, we, know, we know about your family. We, we know what you do for, for pleasure. Is the fact that it's such a small country make it more difficult? We certainly live in a little bubble. But on the other hand, you think of the American campaign going on at the moment. We know, well, we think we know everything there is to know about the people. But then most people will never think they'd get to see those people or, or meet them. Whereas in New Zealand, there's every chance that I as Prime Minister might pop up in your local school or community hall or the ward at the hospital or be very much in contact with people. So I think our democracy is so much more intimate than a, a great uh, country like the United States with its quarter of a million, billion plus people can be. Let's talk about the, the way people do see Labour. Um, I think that, that one of the... Um, one of the things that, that's very much part of Labour's history has been that strong Christian ethos. So we think of Michael Joseph Savage, um, Labour's roots in, in the UK, very much based in, in a strong Christian ethic. And yet today, m many Christian groups and Christians appear to be looking towards the right rather than towards the left. Has Labour lost touch, do you think, with that, 
that early Christian ethos? Well, there's no doubt that the tradition of the Labour Party in Britain came out of the chapels. It came out of the Methodist chapels, probably the Baptist chapels, and then also the Roman Catholic people who were often the poorest, the, the Irish who went to Glasgow, Irish who came to the west coast of New Zealand. And we still retain very strong links into what I'd perhaps describe as social justice, uh, Christianity. Now, Christianity is, is a very, very wide spectrum, as we know. Uh, all great religions uh, cover a very wide range of views, and so some parts of the spectrum will be more inclined to go to the right of politics, but there's certainly still a tremendous number of people in our party who are churchgoers, uh, who would see themselves as actively practicing uh, religion, uh, the social justice Christians. Do you think the church has a role then in, in New Zealand society? Oh yes, I do. I think the church has a tremendous role. And some of the meetings I've enjoyed over the years have been when the church leaders have come in to meet with me and, and other ministers. And they've always put a lot of thought into what they want to present to us. So they'll come with a list of issues. And we'll have a quite a long discussion about those issues. We actually find ourselves pretty close together on them. Often uh, the church leaders uh, would like more to be done uh, and faster, and we're saying, look, you know, we want to get there too, but we've got to make things add up. There's only so much we can take in taxes, and then we have to prioritise. But we haven't really felt any difference of direction on where we want to go. As I say, I think our churches are very motivated also by a feeling of social justice. Uh, they want to support the poor to climb up a ladder of opportunity and aspiration. Uh, they don't want suffering nor do we. So we start from a very common point. So what do you think are the key issues then for, for this election? Presumably the economy will be... Well, the, the this election it is the economy above all because we've had this incredible offshore shock and it's come in different waves. It started coming last year, probably we weren't so aware of it, except that our interest rates stayed up longer than they otherwise would have. Because while we have a very secure banking system here, our banks secure credit offshore. And when we had this crisis in what they call the subprime market in the States, that eventually affected the ability of banks to get credit lines. So that tightened credit here. Interest rates stayed higher than they should have. But I think the wave of this crisis that people have really noticed has been the last six, seven, eight weeks with what's happened on Wall Street, this incredible phenomenon of the American government, $700 billion bailout, uh, the, the British government's huge underwrite, and it's starting to come through to New Zealand that this is affecting the real economy as well, and that we're going to have to be very proactive here about how we kickstart our economy again. That's why I've been talking about bringing forward some of the infrastructure spending, uh, the investment in education and skills, because we need to be ready for takeoff when the international economy comes right. Now, we have an MMP. Uh -huh. An MMP system here, which I've never found yet anyone who's admitted to voting for MMP, but somebody must have. A majority did. Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> They've just all gone to ground now. Yeah. You have made a success of MMP. You, you've worked with people as diverse as, as Winston Peters, Jeanette Simons. Is that the secret is, of, of MMP, is making those sort of personal relationships with people? Very much about building respect for each other. And you're right, we have worked with very different people. You know, right through until the election, right through to the last confidence and supply vote, Gordon Copeland was still giving confidence and supply support to the government because he was an honourable person and that's what he signed up for in an agreement at the start of this last term. So we worked with United Future. Uh, we worked with New Zealand First, we've worked with the Green Party, worked with the Alliance, which then became the Progressives. We've had a relationship with the Māori Party. So you've got to have the sort of personality and leadership style which can be inclusive. You're not going to agree with everyone on everything, but you have to be very careful what arguments you pick because you're going to be wanting to work with people on a, on a lot of issues. Are they non-negotiables? Well... Look, look, there are some things, obviously, that are bottom lines for parties, and sometimes we'll approach different parties looking for support for things, and they'll say, look, we just can't go there, and we respect that. And our practice has been, if you can't pass something, you can't pass it. Just pull back and get on to the next thing. It's, it's not going to be the end of the world. Do you have in your mind a point where you say, we will not go any further because... That's not what we do, however much our coalition partner wants. There, there may be things where you feel you just can't uh, amend something anymore, and at that point you just have to pull back and say, well, wait, 
You see, we had an instance like that with the Joint Therapeutics Agency with Australia, where we had a treaty with Australia, and we couldn't get the legislation through our parliament without completely making a mockery of it. So we, we pulled back and we said, one day there'll be a majority in the parliament that will want to deal with this.